So just a, um, a heads up on that. We have joining us today our new finance director, Sean Mangano, and our comptroller, Sonia Aldrich, as well as town manager, Paul Balkelman. So I guess you could tell that the theme of today is finance and budget, but we are welcome and open to all questions. Um, if you do have a question during this session, please use the Q&A function from Zoom. You can alternatively raise your hand in Zoom, or if you're joining us from a phone, please press star nine to raise your hand. So I'll just uh, let Paul also welcome everybody. Yeah, thanks everybody. This is uh, really informal. We'll, our ideal thing is to answer questions for folks or have a conversation with you about what's happening. Um, and it's, I was thinking last night about just this year is like no other, um, you know, with multiple budgets that we've been working on with the pandemic, um, with I think really a sea change on, um, on racial issues that we're, that we're going to be, that we're going to really focus on. I think that there's just so much happening and, um, it's, it's a pivotal year. I think it's going to be one of those years. Sometimes people have a certain year, 1970 or something like that. Um, this is going to be one of those years, I think, where we, we never forget it. And I, today, the, um, the seniors at Amherst Regional High School are having uh, some, you know, a, a drive-by parade, you know, where they start at all the elementary schools, come to the high school, and then drive away from there. And for them, I think that's a memorable, memorable year, too. So, Anyway, uh, I just was thinking about that last night, so I started with that, um, but it's really, we can talk about whatever people want to talk about. Talk about. And I don't know if, Sean, since you're, you're new to the, the team and new to this uh, platform, if you wanted to take a second to introduce yourself. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Sean uh, Mangano. I worked over on the school side for the last 10 years and then came over to the town side and then bittersweet. I really miss everybody over on the school side, but I'm getting to work with a lot of great people on the town side. And it's nice having both perspectives. There are a lot of things on the school side that came down to us from the town. I didn't really understood how it worked. And now on the town side, I'm seeing that back end. And so it's nice to get that full complete picture of how the whole town operates. And um, I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, not just, I mean, Sonia and I are just so really happy that Sean uh, decided to come back to on the town side, as he said, um, because, and we, we're actually kind of fortunate because Sean has a deep understanding of the school side of things. And the school's finance director, Doug Slaughter, had been the chair of the finance committee and a select board member. And he has a deep understanding of the town side. So I think position, you know, we have a lot of great conversation happening. Uh, across the two sides, which are the two biggest pieces of the budget. Um, and so, and just also, I just need to acknowledge that, you know, Sonia has been the rock for the last several years, make sure, making sure that all of our finances are set, uh, has provided leadership at, on every level uh, for her staff and for me. And um, so I want to thank her for the all the time that she's been putting in and she's not going away. <laughs> we won't let her. Um, Sean won't let her. Um, so, um, yeah, so Sonia's been keeping me on track for, you know, even when I was on the school, she's been keeping me on track. <laughs> so it's, it's not just me. <laughs> I'm just going to remind um, the folks who just joined us, feel free, we would love for you to come in and ask your questions live. Um, it looks like our good friend Ken just raised his hand. So I'm going to pull Ken into the room. Ken, if you could unmute and introduce. Thank you, Brianna. I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live on Sunset Avenue, and I don't want to monopolize this conversation. Thanks for the opportunity to get in early. Um, we've always had wonderful financial management in this town, and I think we're going to need it. So I want to thank Sonia and Sean. We're going to be, well, you know far better than those of us who live here that we're being hit by a terrible reduction in, in income and increase in expenses and it's a challenge. So thank you for taking on this job and, and good luck. I had sent, Brianna, I had sent you and Paul a note about how to change the format of these meetings um, so that you could see who all is in attendance and we could see each other, though not interfere with the conversation. And I don't want to beat a dead horse. If that's really a dead horse, you tell me. But is, it, is that worth talking about some more and pursuing? 
Sure, I'd love to address that, Ken, and I thank you for your, your thoughtful um, email. And it's something we're very aware of. Um, and just, just out of a few steps of extra precaution, I mean, we can see the participants in the room. Um, the way that we've decided to structure these just for right now is to not allow very open um, access in terms of coming into the room and being able to view your screen and um, have people talk um, all at once. We are looking for safe ways to do that. And just as a government entity, we are a little bit more um, of a target in terms of nefarious activity. So we are trying to walk the line of uh, meaningful engagement and um, also making sure our participants are safe. So um, I'd love to continue that conversation with you and I will follow up with your email that you sent. We can try to um, see what steps we can take to make it make you all more visible to each other in a safe way. Yeah, I'll just add so that if anybody listens to it, that I was, that the proposal I gave you is one that works not to allow anybody to talk whom you do not want to talk. So you control the unmuting and the muting. And therefore, there's no way for somebody to interrupt or, or Zoom bomb verbally. That doesn't mean that they couldn't hold up a small sign or something in their little window and be seen by others, but it would keep their voice silent. Thank you for listening and thank you again for doing this. Uh, I really appreciate it and that's all I have to say right now. Thanks again. So Ken, I, I just wanna jump in on this too because you know, this is a con concern that the counselors have I, I, you know, asked for because they, they, it is a little alienating not to see your audience and it's harder to visualize what's happening. But we, this is not just a theoretical thing. We have had committee meetings Zoom bombed where people have projected uh, pornographic images and it's not something that we that's that doesn't create a sp safe space for a place for people to meet town of amherst is a particular target um all of our meetings are public uh it's not like a private thing where you're you you're here by invitation only and i really don't want to be in a space where that's a possibility now it, you could say in a public meeting that's that's possible but there's a certain anonymity that comes along with the the zoom platform so um you know, I think, you know, it, it, you know that, that's the concern. I mean, with one of our committees, just I think two or three weeks ago, it happened pre prior to that, it happened to another committee. So um, we're super cautious about it because we have direct uh, experience with it. Thanks, so Brianna, maybe you and I can talk further because I, I, I think we can solve the voice one. I don't know whether mm -hmm. we can solve the visual one. And if we can't, I would be on your side with that too. But if we can, we'll talk further. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ken, and we will talk. Um, and if you have other questions, just throw your hand back up and we'll bring you back into the room. Brianna, can I respond to his uh, first point? Oh, absolutely. So just following up on the, the strong financial leadership. Um, yeah, we have, the town has had very good leadership from John Musanti to Sandy Pooler to Sonia and Paul with um, Paul's financial background. And we've had very strong finance committees and select boards in the past and now town council. Um, and so we are going into a very tough sort of economic environment, um, but we are fortunate that we are in a very strong place in terms of our um, past planning around reserves and, and capital and things that we've addressed in the past. Um, we are in a position of strength to weather this storm. Um, and so we'll be planning very carefully going forward. But um, I personally thank all those people that came before me because they put us in a very strong spot. Great, thank you, Sean. So there did, um, there was a, a question that came into the Q&A. Um, Sarah wants to know if there's any update on aid from the state. Yeah, do you want me to do that, Paul, or a brief update? So there are lots of buckets of aid from the state. I think last time I checked, there were maybe 70 or so different, um, different little buckets of aid to different departments. Some go to the fire department, some go to the health department, the schools. Um, I guess the two primary ones that I can, that are probably most relevant right now are the, the CARES Act, the general one that goes to towns. Uh, we were on a webinar a few weeks ago. Um, the town has been allocated about $3 million to help address the expenses related to the COVID crisis. Um, we are in the process of submitting expenditures for FY20 to get reimbursed from that money. And then there's gonna be an opportunity to, to get FY21 expenditures reimbursed as well. Um, we are also, there's a lot of people lobbying at the federal level to allow us to use that money to replace lost revenue. Currently, we're not allowed to do that. Um, but that would be another huge um, 
approach we could take to address our budget crisis coming up, um, but currently we can't do that. Um, the other bucket of money from the CARES Act is something the schools received. It's um, the acronym is ESSER, but it's um, they received I think a couple hundred thousand dollars as well um, to help with distance learning and other school related expenses. Um, and so that those are sort of the additional aid packages that have come down from the federal government through the state. Um, in terms of the state's budget and their finances, um, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, at this point, we haven't heard anything about a budget being approved anytime soon. And so we're still just kind of keeping our ears open for what's coming up. Great, thank you. It looks like we have a question from Jeff. So Jeff, if you could unmute your mic and introduce yourself. Hi, yeah, I'm Jeff Lee from uh, Southeast Street, currently in Poland, Maine. But um, Jeff, Poland, Maine? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A little quarantine vacation up here, but nice. Uh, <laughs> um, yep. First, I just wanted to second Ken's suggestion. It would be great if we could see the participants. It'd be much more like the regular cup of joes that uh, I enjoy and get a lot of, out of. Um, hopefully, we'll be back to the normal cup of joes at some mm -hmm. point. Uh, uh, also, had a question for Sean. Um, Sean, I think before you left previously, you had been working on a public budget tool that people could kind of explore different uh, scenarios. And I wonder if that's still in the works. Yeah, so I, I think you're referring to the, um, the capital project planning tool and um, just a little history about that. So um, Sandy Pooler actually developed that before he left um, based on the assumptions around the capital projects at the time. Um, I've adapted it and try to bring it up to date with how things have evolved and, you know, done little different things with it, but um, it's sort of been a town wide project. Um, I think it's up, to, it's at the point where now it's really, we've used it to, an ex to help provide some planning information and we can continue to help. Uh, you, we can continue to use it to help provide planning information for the future. Um, I think some of the capital project conversations have um, been delayed a little bit because of all, all everything that's happening with COVID. So, um, I suspect it's going to continue to be used um, for our planning and whatever else the council and, and the town manager want to use it for. Thanks. Jeff, did you have any other uh, follow-up questions or? Uh, no, no, okay. thanks. Uh, appreciate it. Okay, thank you. We have another question here just in general. Um, what this year has been like in terms of your budget process compared to other years. Well, I, Sonia Paul handle. Okay, I think so. Sonia's built a, a bunch of budgets. She's she's gone through a couple budgets this fiscal. You want to talk about what how, how many you've put together, Sonia? Uh, about three or four. <laughs> um, different budgets. It's been chaotic. It's, it's really kind of crazy. We were doing really well with the budget cycle this year. It's been a lot of changes over the last few years with the new government and everything. It took us a long time to to um get a straight path and my office here, Holly Bowser, my assistant and I, we spent a lot of time trying to document a process that would go smoothly and we were really rocking it and then COVID hit and just threw us for a loop and everything dropped and we were dealing with um, the COVID crisis and now we're just trying to pick up the pieces. We had the one month budget all ready to go. I think we're in a really good place um, and we're, we're, we have a balanced budget at the moment until we find out what state aid is going to do. We, we budgeted for level state aid and um, yeah, I'm not really good at these open meetings. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, it's true. But it's true. I mean, we were we were there on the FY21 budget. And then um, just we were in the, you know, the stages of let's put the book together. And then this whole thing blew up. And then, you know, everything got delayed, which is good. We gr were grateful that the town council delayed the submission of documents. I think that was a wise action. So we have submitted and the council will have a public hearing on Monday on the one month budget, which gets us through July. And it's just basically what our normal budget, what we normally spend in July. So it's, it's not it's not a one twelfth budget. You, if you do the math, it won't be one twelfth. It's about one month. And then a month later during July, we'll be going through a budget line by line 
just like old times um, with the town council on the FY21 budget. And then that's that's the, the real document that you're used to seeing in terms of a lot of supporting documentation and things like that. Um, though there's the hearings and that will happen during July. I think the finance committee is meeting twice a week all through July to go through that. Um, but I think we're pretty confident. Um, we have a really good plan of make sure that we're meeting all of our, all the requests, all the services that we've typically provided. Um, but you know, we just have to acknowledge that it, this is a nutty year, and the schools, you know, what that's going to look like in the fall. That's a major source of um, um, expenses for the town, and what that's going to look like. And I think they've been doing a spectacular job figuring things out over there. Uh, really, kudos to Mike and his leadership team for putting education first, and and along with safety of the students and the staff. So, but just. I, know, I just have to say that we had this thing done and then this thing blew in and everything got turned upside down, so. If I could just say one more thing, I am extremely grateful to have Sean on board. Any happier, it's the best outcome I could hope for. To have I mean, I'm, I'm making her say that, I told her. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, do, we do have a, a hand in the room and this person's display name is not up, but I think it might be Phyllis. So Phyllis, if this is you, um, you are now in the room. If you want to unmute and ask your question, introduce yourself too, please. Phyllis Lehrer, Pondview Drive. I have two items, one to Ken and Jeff. If we have to have visual eight o'clock means we have to be dressed <laughs> and we can't eat our oatmeal and drink our coffee because that's rude. But my sort of economic question, I don't know if it would help the budget or not, is will we be able to buy dump stickers on July 1? I'm looking at Sonia. I think so. I don't think there's anything. Yeah, I think that they expire on, on July 1, and there's, we're going to be prepared to sell them. Um, okay. Yeah, I can follow up with that with Gilford, but I think we're looking at putting them online, right, Sean? Oh. Yeah. We can, um, we can follow up with an email, Phyllis, once we get more details and we can send it over to you if that's helpful. Appreciate that. Thank you. Bye. And Bye. On that note, one thing that's been an interesting development is that we've seen our, our revenue for our, um, our transportation and for our dump go up this year. I think everyone's seen a lot of people doing their yard work and you know, cleaning up things and tackling projects that they may have had on hold. So one, you know, unexpected consequence of the COVID crisis is that our, our revenue has actually gone up in that one area. Oh, good. Phyllis, any follow-ups or was, was no, that? No, but thank you very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank Thanks you for, for joining being here. us. Yeah. Okay, so we got a question that came in from Maura. She wants to know, will, will the capital budget planning tool be made available to the public at some point? Yes, it will. Um, <clears throat> again, this we, that whole thing has been set off to the side. We actually had been, even after Sean left the schools, he had been working with us on getting that, that tool up and running. Um, so it's not ready for public, you know, for, it's a very complicated tool and, it, and we wanna make sure that the public has access to it in a way that makes it understandable for how to use it. Um, so once we reorient, tend, reorient, bleh, once we go back to getting normal um, to how we're doing things and we can start refocusing on the, the major capital projects, which should be, you know, relatively soon once we get through this budget process. Um, I think that's, we'll be having that conversation with the finance committee again. Anything? One, yeah, one thing I'll add is um, we, we also have to look at some of the assumptions now under, under our current economic situation that weren't yeah. present last time we developed the tool. Um, so when the tool was being worked on before, you know, the economy was, going great and we had, you know, our reserves are very high um, and we weren't anticipating having to use our reserves for anything else besides maybe supporting the capital going forward. Um, now we're in a place where you know, we have to be concerned with state aid and possibly using our reserves to help supplant whatever state aid reductions we have. Um, so we just also have to be mindful of that is that our, our current economic situation is a little different and so we have to be, think about how that affects the, the tool and, how the, and the planning going forward. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a question that came in from Sarah. She'd like us to discuss how pilots or payment in lieu of taxes are determined and how that may change for the next fiscal year or two in Amherst. 
so pilots are typically what they are. Um, we use them most frequently on solar projects. So instead of taxing the equipment on the land, we, there's an agreement in a sort of standard format that um, David Burgess, our, our assessor, put together. Um, and it sort of looks at the value of the uh, equipment. And then we agree on how much that entity will pay in taxes every year. Um, th that is, those are, that's where we use the pilots in most frequently. Um, okay, <laughs> I see your, your note. So you're thinking more about, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the colleges and university and what, how they um, are paying us. So um, we, are, we, we were in the middle of negotiations with the university when COVID-19 hit um, it, for a new strategic partnership agreement. They have made a commitment and have continued with a, com a new commitment uh, or a commitment of dedicated funds to the schools. Um, you know, those discussions have been turned around also because much of our discussion with them was focused on the additional uh, EMS staff that we would always have to bring to, to the table during peak seasons in the spring and in the fall. And now there are no students uh, who are here and our fire calls have been flat and our ambulance calls have been flat. There haven't been that many. Um, <clears throat> so, so their point is what's, you know, we're not, we're not placing a demand on you anymore. They understand that this is short term um, and that they also have brought to the table that they are under ex extreme um, financial stress uh, as a university. So um, a lot of the uh, agreements with the, col the Amherst College and with the university is based on ambulance runs. And we look at that historically, what kind of ambulance runs have been uh, made to those two locations and then how that, um, you know, and we go back in time on that. So you want to talk anything about that, about how that's all put together or not? So the partnership agreement? No, the, uh, amb how the ambulance funds are, collected on that. The ambulance funds go directly into a receipts reserve for appropriation account. That yeah, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure what you're, what you're asking. <laughs> to explain <laughs> how the budget works. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna need more than an hour for that one, I think. <laughs> um, so hope, did, did that, let's see. Sarah, if that didn't address all of your questions, please just pop another question in the chat and I'll make sure that gets clarified for you or feel free to raise your hand as well. Um, we have a question here about, is the, is the town getting extra money from the state or federal government and how can that money be spent? Is it, does it have to be spent on COVID specific um, items? Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll um, kind of clarify a little bit more about what I said earlier. Um, so we are getting, money from the CARES Act, which is from the federal government and has flowed through the state. Um, currently, that money, the money that's the big pot of money for the town, can only be used to reimburse COVID expenditures, uh, COVID-related expenditures that were necessary because of the COVID crisis, um, were incurred after March 1st, and were not budgeted for. So there's, they have eligibility criteria and they give a bunch of examples of things that can be covered. Um, one example, just to to highlight that is so PP&E and cleaning, you know, additional cleaning um, equipment or contracted services related to cleaning, those types of things are all reimbursable, covered under the, the CARES Act. Um, if we had to hire um, additional staff um, at the fire department or in the EMS services um, or pay them overtime because of the care, because of the COVID crisis, that those costs are also um, reimbursable. Um, going back to the, putting my school hat back on, if we had to uh, purchase additional computers for distance learning, um, those types of things, or even computers for town staff um, to work remotely because they kind of come in because of the stay at home order. Um, those types of things are also reimbursable through the CARES Act. Uh, the, the other source of funds that um, we are looking, what we will be pursuing are FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Group there. They will reimburse 75% of eligible costs and the CARES Act we can use for the other 25%. So in addition to applying for the CARES Act, we'll also be submitting an application to FEMA uh, to get reimbursed for any of the costs we've incurred um, that are eligible. So we are, there, is, there are funding sources from the federal government and the state right now, um, and there's a lot going on to get additional funds as well. 
Great, thank you. Um, I do see in the room our council president, Lynn Griesmer. I'm gonna give her a chance if she wants to raise her hand and come on in to, to say hi to the group. If not, we understand. Oh, there she goes. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna invite Lynn in. Lynn, if you could unmute. Good morning. Hi, first of all, let me say thanks publicly again to Sonia for uh, not just keeping Sean straight, keeping Paul straight, but for letting the council sit at her doorstep and ask all of our inane questions as we began um, our term and continue to ask her those questions. And once in a while, Sean learns something from the questions we ask. So <laughs> there you go. Um, I just want to say I, I appreciate all the questions about the uh, financial uh, position of the town. Uh, this is um, going to be a very unusual year. Um, and I just want to say up front that next year could even be more unusual. And in that case, I mean, not good. So it's this, we're, we're facing some tough times. So those of you that have been around through the 2008, 9, and 10 period, um, that was tough. And this will be tough in a similar way. So um, that said, we're still trying to keep our eye on the ball of the capital projects to the extent that uh, the state even can go forward. And we're also um, obviously working with Paul to extend dates for budgets and things like that. So I just wanna thank all of you, Sean, um, Sonia and Paul for their own financial aspects of the town. Yeah, I think Lynn brings up a really important point because, you know, we've been focused on FY21, but, you know, as we talk internally and with Lynn, she, uh, and she knows this, FY22 is going to be the challenge, we think. It depends, right? We, there's so many uncertainties. The state doesn't even have a budget yet. Um, but that's the thing, that's the time when we think, you know, we've used a lot, a lot of our basic tools um, this year. But FY2022 might become a bigger issue once we know what the true costs of this are or how long it's going to sustain or how long the economic uh, um, recession will be. So, I mean, Sonia, you've thought about the FY22 as well, you know? Yeah. So. Because a lot, a lot of our revenues are, are um, lagging a year or two behind, like PBTA. Um, the, the five college and the UMass portions are a big part of what comes in for revenue on the PBTA and it's based on ridership, but it's based on ridership from two fiscal years ago. So eventually this one is going to catch up and we're going to have less revenue the year. So we have to plan for these revenues that we know are going to go down in 22. Hopefully the others will go back up and we'll be okay. So if anybody has a question while Lynn's still in the room, feel free to raise your hand, star nine from the phone, or use Q&A. Um, we had a, a question. We've gotten this a lot as well. W when is town hall reopening? Um, and just general questions about continued access to town services, bill pay, um, et cetera. Yeah, so I think, uh, well, let's talk about the online services. We're making really great progress on that. Um, and somebody here probably has better information than I do in terms of the, and maybe Brianna, you do on the permit software and things that we're moving forward on. And I know that you've been working hard on uh, getting some other aspects online. So let me, but I'll talk to the other piece. So we are um, bringing employees back to work uh, beginning on June 15th. Uh, the building will not be open to the public though. We are first making sure that our employees are safe and can work in a safe um, safe place. We will um, continue to serve people, um, you know, through the back door of town hall, through the side door of town hall. They're, they're, every department's worked with anybody who's needed something. If they needed marriage intentions or something like that, something that physically has to be done, our town clerk and others have worked with the folks who need it. So town hall, I don't anticipate opening uh, at least until after the 4th of July. Uh, to the public and in many if you, when you see some town halls opening you'll see that it's by appointment only and that's might be where we where we are in terms of like meeting with building contractors and things like that that's sort of one of the, the key functions that people come in 
almost all the other transaction things can happen uh, online or through the, uh, we have a box on the side of the building you can put uh, tax payments and things like that in. Um, you know, in terms of public meetings, you know, that we, we've found these Zoom, pla Zoom platforms to be pretty successful in terms of uh, public meetings and in fact, more successful than in-person meetings because we get more people to show up many times. Um, and people have better access to, if you have mobility issues or something, they have better access to our meetings. And we're recording all of our meetings now, which so they're, people can watch them. They don't have to be there at the meeting at that time to participate. So we, I have found the Zoom meetings to be um, pretty productive on that end. There are downsides. Obviously, we don't get to see each other in that sort of, you don't get to read the room, which is, I think, what, what Jeff and um, uh, Ken were talking about. You, you know, it's, you'd like to see people and their body language and stuff like that. Um, so I don't anticipate opening, having public meetings for quite some time. And the reason for that is that when you look at the spread of COVID-19, if you were to say, let's put a group of people in a small space for an extended period of time, that's the recipe for spreading the disease. And that's exactly the thing we should not be doing. And so in terms of bringing people into a room um, that by definition has to be open to the public for public meetings um, and uh, with, the, with the capacity of the room limiting it, I think that's gonna be a, a bit, a bit away, of a ways off. In terms of the senior center, um, we don't think that's going to open probably at all this year. Our senior director is on the reopening advisory committee for the state. And so you will see some rogue, some different towns with a senior center that might open here or there. But by, by and large, most senior centers will be closed for the rest of the year. Do you want to talk about the online stuff, Bree? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in terms of bill pay right now, most things you can, you can um, pay online, motor vehicles, parking tickets, which you probably don't have right now, uh, property taxes, real estate, utility bills. You can also enroll in automatic billing or paperless billing. And coming as of Monday, um, for those of you who haven't gotten your dog licenses renewed yet um, and, and or need access to vital records, we will be bringing those online for you to request and pay online. Um, and then the, the clerk will send them out to you. Um, so that'll be something that's coming up on Monday. And we're, we're really looking for ways to kind of optimize that digital town hall, if you will. Um, you can make service requests if you're seeing potholes on, in areas right from our website as well. So um, we're hoping to improve the kind of one-stop shopping for online services as we move forward um, out of necessity, but also um, to make it easier for you to, to go about your business and, during COVID. So you'll be seeing more and more from us um, adding to those digital services. And if there are things that you see that aren't there, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you have an idea about something that we could be doing better online, um, let us know. Email us at info at amersma.gov. Yes, the other thing you guys, the IT department is working on with the inspection services is getting building permits and all that online. That's a big one. That's a, that's a very big project, but it will be um, something that's well worth it. And we will, we'll see certain types of permits trickle in online first. I think one of the first ones will be um, rental registration permits to be completed, um, which it can already be done online, but we're, we've uh, moved to a new platform should make it a lot easier for the user as well as contractors who are trying to um, do work in our town and get it permitted. Um, so that, that's coming, uh, that'll be rolling out this summer and continuing to um, add different types of permits to that. And um, Brianna, I'll just add, um, people are still in the office answering phones. So if anybody has a question, they want to talk to somebody, um, there are still people here answering phones um, during the day. So feel free to call um, if you have a question. Definitely. I think, I think in, in, in Amherst, we've gotten, try to offer many different ways for you to get in touch with us the way that you feel comfortable phones you can still mail us something email use our dropbox so um, any which way that you're comfortable okay so i have a, a question here what the what's the single biggest budget challenge we're, we're facing right now and that might not be easy to pick just one but um if you guys want to address that you want me to go first? Sure. So, I mean, I think this year just has a unprecedented, 
unprecedented level of uncertainty. Um, there's always some uncertainty with budgeting, but typically the way the process works for the state, there's some numbers that are known that we can bank on for our budgets. Um, this year is very different. We don't have any numbers from the state that we can bank on. Our local economy is very uncertain in terms of when things will come back online. Um, the status of the colleges, which really impacts our economy is uncertain. Um, what the schools will look like, as Paul mentioned earlier, you know, what, what version of the schools will come back. Um, so I, it's sort of a broad answer, but I think that's the biggest challenge this year is we're having to have a very wide range of planning um, because things could come back better than expected or they could come back worse than expected. Um, and that range is very wide. So for me, that's the biggest challenge is that there's really very few knowns at this time and we're just doing our best to go with the best information that's available. And I'll echo that. Paul, Lynn? Yeah. Well, for, I'll, I'll jump in and then um, I think for, it's, for me, it's partially budget, but it's also the demands on the staff because we've taken everybody out of their comfort zones on how they do work. And, you know, like Bree, you talked about the permitting software. That's happening, but it's all happening remotely with remote meetings and things like that, which is not how we normally would do that. We'd have peop the, the people, the users and the, you know, our staff users in a room talking to each other. And now it's all being done remotely and, and just lots of different things that, um, that we're going to be asking our staff to do. We've asked a lot of staff to do things differently or do different jobs, quite, you know, su substantially different jobs. Um, so I think um, managing our budget because ultimately I think we want to get back to the a budget normal. Um, but in the meantime, we've got this, all this disruption happening. And so um, that uncertainty with the budget, we're, I think we, providing a bit of stability to our departments and uh, predictability is the hardest thing for, for us right now. Yeah, and I'll say the one of the silver linings that I've seen in my short time here so far is that we are, um, we are using resources the best way we can. Um, so if there's one area that has been impacted by COVID or you know, if it's parking or um, the front counter here, we're, we're, we're reallocating resources to where they're needed. Um, and those conversations are going on constantly about where do we have, need, have additional staffing needs and what, where do we have some area where we can move or we have staff that are freed up because of COVID. Um, and so we're trying to be very flexible and adapt to the situation as we go. And, it, and from what I've seen so far, the, the town's doing a good job of that. And Lynn has her hand up too. So go ahead, Lynn. Um, I think it, absolutely the unpredictability and it this time it's even, more unpredictable than 2008, nine, and 10. The good news is that you've got people like Andy Steinberg and Doug Slaughter who were actually on the finance committee during that time and have continued in various government roles, either elected and or now, in Doug's case, working for the schools where he worked before. Um, and then, you know, there's a couple of us, myself included, who've worked for quote state agencies in my case, Massachusetts. And, so we've been through some of these budget cycles. Uh, it still makes it very tough um, for a council, 13 people, uh, to comprehend and anticipate because you just can't anticipate if you don't have good measures to go with. Our experienced staff and our uh, leadership, I think, is, is very critical to us at this point because they've kind of been there, done that, and we're doing the best we can to navigate through um, uncertain times. Yeah, and just adding to what Lynn said, um, one, of, one of the strengths of the town that I observed on the school side, um, I'm sure Paul and Lynn will echo and Sonia, is just how good the relationships are between all the departments. Um, a lot of times, towns can have some, you know, butting of heads between different departments on the budget or different situations. Um, in this town, since I've been here at least the last 10 years, all the departments work very collaboratively. We solve problems together. Um, everyone contributes to solving the problem. There's not, you know, there's not one that sort of tries to stay out of it. Um, we all work very well together. Um, and I think that's a huge strength of the town that we want to keep going forward. No, absolutely. So, Moving forward, how, what are the best ways that our community members can stay up to date on the budget? How can they participate? What's the next uh, big milestone that people should be paying attention to? 
So we will be putting the, if the budget calendar is not already on the website, we'll be putting the budget calendar on the website. Um, Brianna just the other day showed me how to uh, access the budget feedback form. So there's a, a form on the website that um, residents can submit questions on the budget or their thoughts on the budget and we'll get that directly and can um, address it. Um, they can also email Sonia, Paul, or I, they can email their counselors questions. Um, and, and we also always welcome them, uh, residents at meetings to ask questions on the budget. And there's gonna be a lot of meetings on the budget. Once you see the calendar, there's gonna, you'll see there's gonna be a lot of opportunities to ask questions on the budget. So, um, and there will be budget specific meetings for different departments. So if your question's on a specific department, um, whether it be the schools or public safety or DPW, um, you'll see that there's a specific meeting set up for those. So there's gonna be a lot of opportunities and, um, and we welcome your input. Oh, that's great, that's great. And we will, um, as, as we move forward into, as we get deeper into this and more information becomes available and meetings are on that budget calendar, we'll be sure to um, share that out in a way that's prominent and easy to ask, access for everybody. Yes, I, I think the arena really shifts once we submit our budget shifts to the town council. And, you know, Lynn and Andy, Andy is chair of the finance committee and Lynn is, is president of the council are managing all those. There's a lot of places where people can involve with public hearings and public forums and things like that. But that's really the venue for public engagement is at those public meetings. And there's also, we should mention, there's also a budget page uh, that, that um, will keep filling things in as, we, as they become available. So I think it's amherstma.gov slash budget and you can get everything uh, on that one site and you can links to everything, schools, library, everything that we have. So let's see, Sarah asks, how is the census proceeding here in Amherst? And I'm happy to answer that if, if yeah. You're the expert. So the census right now, um, as of yesterday, we're at an Amherst sixty-one point seven percent self-response rate. Um, historically, in the last census, we were one of the hardest to count communities in Massachusetts, largely to beca because of our um, large student population. Um, so this year, we were expecting a hard count again, and then COVID happened. Um, a lot of the students who were living off campus um, moved home. So where we're at right now is we've got confirmation from the three um, colleges in the university, two colleges in the university that the students who were living on campus will be counted by administrative record, despite if they've left um, and gone home at this point. The tough thing for us will be um, making sure that the off-campus students were able to um, answer their census where they lived while they were in college. So there have been some efforts directed to those students who were living off campus, mainly at UMass. Um, so that number is not extremely high. We'd like it to be higher. Um, I will say that that percentage does not include the administrative record count from the colleges and universities. So it might be falsely low, uh, but we are still encouraging folks to go online, answer their census, fill out the paperwork, or um, do it via phone. And we just recently received a grant from the, the secretary's, uh, the state secretary's office to do some targeted outreach to some of our more uh, vulnerable hard to count populations. So we will have some programming in July specific to um, families with children under five, um, with uh, low income renters or to, um, community members who might not have English as their first language. So we will be doing targeted outreach um, to those groups and to seniors as well, leveraging the existing partnerships we have with the school, with the senior center, um, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of where we are at right now. The, um, the deadline to self-respond is August 11th, unless the federal government agrees to change that. Um, so we're gonna use July as kind of a rally call to make sure everybody's counted in Amherst. And I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions, Sarah, if you, if you do have them based off of that. Okay, I don't see any hands right now or any questions in the, uh, the Q&A box. Is there anything um, any of our panelists would like to say that they didn't get asked yet? Um, I don't have anything actually. 
and we've it's been it's been a you know a lot going on and uh we had, we had, yeah, we had that tragic accident on on West Street. Um, just a lot of things happening in this community right now. And and we do realize that you know not everybody wants to contribute to the the conversation live. It doesn't mean you still can't ask your questions to us or pose thoughts or ideas to us. We we love to hear from you regarding those things. Um, oh. the I've got something. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt okay. you. That's okay. <laughs> That's um, so. Um, just want to start to talk about the um, reopening um, of our businesses, and so uh, the governor approved restaurants to be able to to bypass local zoning and start to expand their footprints outside. And we've been, we've been having meetings with the business improvement district and the chamber to expedite that. And we're I think we're by the first out the door with being able to accept applications. Um, I think the experience is a lot of restaurants are saying, yes, I want to do it. And then when they start to look at it a little closer for them, for their own operations, um, how, ma how much business they would generate to, to open, it becomes, it, it's a harder conversation for themselves, um, whether it makes sense for them to go beyond takeout. But we're really excited about identifying some locations, uh, supporting businesses that want to open. Some businesses are working together to create a sort of place where a lot of where it can be more active. So this will, and we, we're buying the um, the stuff that you need to do to, to separate out uh, sidewalks and things so people can still pass while ha having restaurant attendees sitting outside. So I think that's really exciting. And that's something that um, our, our second floor uh, inspection services staff has been working on. And that team has also did a terrific job of getting the farmer's market open last week. Um, and it'll be open tomorrow uh, at 7.30 um on the on the town common this time and it was a huge turnout a lot of the vendors sold out uh all their goods so that was a really positive um harbinger of spring in a lot of ways people were anxious to get to some place that felt like a little bit of normal and it was different but it was nice for a lot of folks to see the the vendors that they're used to seeing thank you paul Sarah did ask a question um, while you were talking about businesses going back to um, budget related matters. Are you planning for possible decreases of state aid? Um, for example, a reduction by 10%, 20% and what are we doing to plan for that? Yeah, Sonia, do you wanna talk a little bit about the plan um, for state aid? You're muted. First time. <laughs> nice good one um sure we have a balanced budget right now we balance the uh budget um not using any of our reserves and we assumed level state aid for fiscal year that we have in fiscal year 20. so um once the state gives us more information whether they're going to cut our percentage or not that's where we would we would go into our reserves. That was the plan that we had to help us get our budget moving to go forward because we're not sure when the state is gonna come with information. It could be halfway through the year, so. Yeah, and along those lines, our community along with a lot of other communities um, are planning to have to revisit this budget in the fall when more information is available. Um, whether it's making budget adjustments, um, or some, yeah, making budget adjustments to, to reflect whatever comes out of the state. Um, we, we just have no sense of when that information is gonna come out. Um, it doesn't seem like it's gonna be anytime soon. All right. So I do not see any other hands in the room, any other questions. Um, if you do have one, now's your chance to get it in under the wire before our wrap time. Paul, um, can I ask a question of Paul? Sure. Yes, you can ask. <laughs> so, you have to raise your hand, though. Sure. <laughs> so, Paul, as a I'm a as a parent of a six year old and a two year old, I'm very interested to know when the spray park is going to open up at uh, at Groff. What, what's the <laughs> timeline there? I second that. Yeah, uh, boy, have you driven by it? No. <laughs> oh my God, you should. It's spectacular looking. It's it's very awesome. close. Um, 
it's you know probably not we're sh hoping for around the fourth of july uh the contractor's still on site so the fencing is still up there's still a lot of work they have a lot of testing of the equipment and things there it's a pretty complex water water feature actually um now we also have all of our playground equipment still roped off although we've had active discussions about what that's going to look like in the summer because with uv rays that does seems does inhibit uh, the virus and because we don't really have the staff to wipe down the, the playground equipment constantly um but I think that that's something that we'll, we, again, talking with our health director, but, you know, once, you know, and, and it will also be staffed. So, you know, you talked earlier about reallocating staff, people who aren't needed in one place, we're putting them someplace else. We want to have someone there at the beginning, especially to help um, monitor it and make sure people are doing proper social distancing as best they can. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty neat looking place. I was out there on Saturday morning and, uh, um, so I don't, again, Dave Zoma, I keep saying, don't make promises. And, um, but, you know, internally we're saying if we could get it by 4th of July, that would be pretty spectacular. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, whether from our panelists or attendees, it doesn't look like I see any in the room. Um, okay. So any last, uh, any last words from anybody before we before we wrap up? No, just thanks for doing this, Brianna. You always do a masterful job at sort of uh, monitoring everything. So we were it, it makes it so much easier when you're a participant. And for the audience, they, they should know that it, it's where we have someone steering the ship here. It's really nice. No, oh, well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, so if, if you have folks that you want to share this with, this video will be up on our YouTube channel. Um, well, along with all the other content that we've been creating, whether it's meetings or our community chats. Um, so feel free to check it out there. Um, we'll probably put it up in the next hour or so in case uh, you wanted to refer back to something or share a particular piece with somebody. And um, again, I'll just go back to saying like Sean and Paul mentioned earlier, um, if you have questions, you can call town hall, at least in the town manager's office, you'll, you'll get either Jen or Angela at any given day. Um, or you can always email us and we'll make sure you get the information you need. So if there's no other questions, I wanna say thank you to Sonia and welcome and thank you to Sean. We look forward to having you um, working with us going forward. And thank you to Lynn for jumping into the conversation as well. Yes, great. Thanks everybody. Good to see you. Have, Have a good, good day. weekend. Yeah. Stay safe.